This is a 2013 Chevy Caprice, and it's weird. You may not think a 10-year-old Chevy sedan could be weird, but this one is. It was built in Australia and then imported to the United States where it was not sold to the general public. That's weird. It also has a big rumbly V8. It's rear wheel drive. And today I'm going to review it, the Chevy Caprice, and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, big news, this Chevy Caprice is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids with no reserve. Like I said, the Caprice wasn't offered for public sale, but some have found their way onto the private used car market and this is the one you want with the upgraded V8 and no holes drilled into it for police lights. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to visit the live auction for this Chevy Caprice where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the Chevy Caprice. Starting from the start, the Caprice was originally a car that Chevy sold in large numbers in the United States from the 1960s all the way till the mid 1990s when Chevy got rid of the Caprice nameplate here in the States. It was a big full size sedan and it was killed in 96. But the Caprice lived on in other markets, specifically specifically Latin America, the Middle East, and Australia. It was redesigned, it became more modern, and it was called various different things depending on the market, although the Caprice name was always used at least somewhere, just not in the United States. Now, here in the States, we got several of these later Caprice models just under different brand names. There was the Pontiac G8, that was sold here in 08 and 09, that was called the Caprice in some places. We got the Chevy SS. That was a great sedan that was sold here in the early to mid 2010s, just not called the Caprice, but it was the Caprice in other places. However, we did also get the Caprice named the Caprice here in the United States, but in a very strange way this car. This Caprice came to the U.S. in 2009, and the weird thing about it is it was only marketed to government fleet buyers, and specifically it was designed to be used as a police car. In fact, the official name was the Chevy Caprice PPV, which stood for Police Pursuit Vehicle. The only people General Motors Chevrolet offered this car to in the United States was governments to be used as a police car. If you were a regular human being, a normal person who wanted to walk into a Chevy dealer and buy one, you couldn't. It was only sold as a police car to governments. This was especially unusual because the Caprice PPV was built in Australia, where it was a popular car called the Holden Caprice, or version of it was the Holden Statesman, the Holden Commodore, all those cars. They built it in Australia, they brought it to the United States, they made it left-hand drive, they called it a Chevy Caprice, but you couldn't buy one unless you were a police department. Now, the reason that Chevy wanted to have a dedicated police car is because they had pretty much owned the police car market back in the early 90s with the old school Caprice. Basically, everyone who had police cars, all the departments were using the Caprice, but when it went away, then the Ford Crown Victoria and the Dodge Charger kind of took up the slack. They got that market away from General Motors who barely had any vehicle. And so this came back to try to give General Motors some competitor in the police car space from about 2009 to 2013 or 14. Now, the Caprice PPV was offered with two available engine choices here in North America. There was a base model with a V6 that made about 300 horsepower, or you could upgrade to the big brawny 6-liter naturally aspirated V8 that made about 355 horsepower. This particular Caprice PPV is 
the dream spec if you're into these cars, which I personally am, because it has the upgraded V8, not the base level six cylinder, and it was a detective model, which means that it doesn't have holes cut in the bodywork for police lights like you might have seen in a traditional police car. It wasn't used that way, and it has a regular back seat with seat belts and no partition between the front and the back like you would have seen in a true police car. This, the detective model, was more stealthy, and it probably got used a little less harshly than a real police car would have been. As for quirks, well, you can imagine that a General Motors vehicle built in Australia, imported to the United States solely for police work, certainly has some, and indeed this car does. To me, on the outside of the Caprice PPV, the biggest quirk is the fact that it has no exterior badging at all. You do have a Chevy badge on the front grille because they couldn't really not put that on there, but otherwise, nothing. It doesn't say Caprice anywhere on the car. It doesn't say Chevrolet anywhere else on the car. There was no badging at all. And that's because General Motors knew that all of these cars would be sold to government fleets. They didn't need to put their badging everywhere because they weren't trying to market it to anyone. And they didn't really want to spend money on badging. You stick a Chevrolet badge on here, it costs a couple bucks a car. It just wasn't needed. They wanted to keep costs down as much as humanly possible to make these cars profitable to sell to fleets. And so, you had no external badging, which is actually kind of cool because this car is already obscure and subtle and you're not really sure what you're looking at. And they didn't really help make it easier by telling you what you were looking at. This is a car where if you know, you know. Otherwise, you really don't. And beyond skipping badging, you can see on the outside of this car, they did other things to make it as cheap as possible. The door handles are plastic, not chromed, not painted, just straight up plastic. You can see it has steel wheels with only this little center cap added. That does include the Chevrolet logo, so I guess there's that one as well. But you didn't get alloys if you got a police car. It wasn't an upgrade deemed necessary. And although there is a fender vent in the front fender, which makes you think they were giving it a little bit of style. No, no. All of these cars, all of the civilian ones sold in other markets had that fender vent too. So it was cheaper to just keep it in place and put in a plastic vent in there to make it as cheap as possible to plug the hole in the fender. And next up, we move inside the Caprice where you quickly discover it is just as anonymous in here as it is on the outside. You open up the door, the door sill says nothing. Just a couple of lines doesn't tell you what this car is or who makes it. In fact, the Chevy badge on the steering wheel is the only emblem on the inside of this car. Nothing anywhere else says Chevy and nothing at all says Caprice. Again, they didn't want to bother to put more money into this car and add badging because that wasn't really the point of this car. They weren't marketing it to anyone. But you get inside the car and you look further in and you can start to quickly realize that something is different about this car than a traditional civilian vehicle. And you especially see that here in the center console where you have a large flat surface. This is where the police computer would have been installed. Police officers can use to look up people's information, license plates, driver's license, that sort of thing. It would have been installed here and there's a power plug for it. You open this up and there's power running to this spot, which which would have charged and powered that police computer. Or on a car that didn't have a computer, it was a flat space that you could use for writing reports or writing other information down, like a desk inside your car. Now, directly behind that, you can see there is a little armrest here with cup holders and a slot to store your phone, but that's an aftermarket addition. It just slides over this center piece. You remove it, and this is what the car came with, another flat surface, again, for report writing or other needs for a desk. This particular one opens up and you can put stuff inside that you might need for your daily police work, but that was the center of this car. Just a lot of flat surfaces and the computer would have been mounted here. And to make that possible, you can see they moved the gear selector all the way over to the side and as far up as they possibly could to create as much space in the center as they could for the items that you'd need for police duty. And another police upgrade, you look up and you see it on the ceiling where there is a, a dome light that really does look like a dome. <laughs> 
that is lighted and there's a switch that you can use to turn it on. This obviously wouldn't have come from the factory in one of these cars. They would have had integrated dome lighting, which this one still has near the rear view mirror, as you can see. But this larger dome light directly above the front seats, that would have given you a little bit more light, again, for writing reports on your center console desk to see inside the car. Now, the other way you could clearly tell that this is a police vehicle, a government fleet car, is by just looking around at all of the materials in here. They are the cheapest things that they could possibly find. <laughs> Now, these cars were sold in other markets as nice vehicles to individual private buyers who got nice versions with leather seats and sunroofs and alloy wheels. But here, because it was only a government fleet car, they have the cheapest plastic around on basically every surface. Again, the goal was not to put in high quality upscale stuff. This was a car you were driving for work to do a job. And so it didn't need the nicest equipment and the nicest materials. And oh boy, does that show as you look around. As for interior quirks and features beyond some of the police stuff, there are certainly some unusual aspects about this car. For instance, you turn it on and it does a speedometer check, as you can see. And when it's finished, it certifies that the speedometer is accurate. It does this every single time you start the car. I don't believe this is related to the police stuff. I think they just did this because it's integrated into this gauge cluster screen. And I don't really think they changed that just for the police market, a speedometer check each time it started, that's certainly unusual. And how about this? On the steering wheel, there is a button with a road on it going towards a mountain range. It looks very beautiful. What does that do? Well, it changes the display in your gauge cluster screen. I don't know why it's a road with mountains, but you press that and you can see various different display screens, including your tire pressure, your speed, your fuel economy, that sort of thing. One interesting display in this gauge cluster screen, it shows you how many gallons of fuel you're using per hour just by sitting idle. This is something that police officers are often doing, sitting idle in a parking lot with the climate control on, with all of the equipment and electronics on, writing reports or doing whatever. And so this is showing you exactly how inefficient you're being by doing that and just sitting there. Also, one other interesting thing you can do in this gauge cluster screen is switch between miles per hour and kilometers per hour on the speedometer. If you switch the units, the speedo instantly switches from miles to kilometers. So instead of having a larger speedometer in miles and a smaller one on the inside in kilometers, it switches the only speedometer you have back and forth and you can just do it at your whim. 60 can become 100 whenever you wish, and you can go back and forth at any given moment. Now, the other screen in this interior is the center control stack screen, the infotainment screen, as we call it, which surprisingly enough is a touch screen. I say surprisingly because of this car's base model status and these buttons flanking the screen. Usually that means the screen is controlled with buttons, but not here. It's a touch screen. Interestingly, this screen allows you to do one thing I have never seen seen before, it lets you configure which features are locked out while the car is moving. Typically, automakers will lock out stuff like navigation, destination entry, or changing your song, whatever, when the car is moving because they don't want you to be distracted. Well, in this car, you can decide if you're distracted or not, and you can change those lockouts, a bizarre setting I have never before seen. But other than that unusual setting, there's not a lot going on in this infotainment system. Very basic, mostly only there to let you change and adjust the radio station or the music that you're listening to. In fact, there's buttons for map and nav, a navigation system, but they don't do anything because this car doesn't actually come with a navigation system. You just get to look at those buttons and remind yourself that you didn't pay extra for it. Not that a police department would have. I actually love these buttons because General Motors didn't even bother putting blank switches here. They just left you with the regular switches, but they don't do anything. That's another thing you can get away with if you're not selling the car to regular consumers. Now, on that subject, it's worth pointing out that this car really is a very no-frills experience. I've already mentioned all the cost-cutting they did, but that 
includes equipment and features. No sunroof, no heated seats, no leather. You don't get any of that stuff, but you do have the basics. A radio with a CD player. You can see how to adjust it here in the center control stack. Below that, you have your climate control with air conditioning and two zones, driver and passenger climate control zones, so they can set their own special temperatures. And you even have a sport mode for the transmission. You can see the sport button right here in front of the gear selector. You press that and you go into sport mode for quicker shifting. You can switch into that if you're in a pursuit and you need to go just a little bit faster. One other nice touch in this car, you do have cruise control, which is surprising. Most police officers aren't cruising anywhere in long distances, but you do have it over on the turn signal stock, which is a weird placement for it. You move the ends of the stock, push the button on the end. That's how you adjust your cruise control, which is a one frill that this car does have. And next up, we move on to the back seat, which is even more no frills, just like up front. Strangely enough, you have leather back here. I assumed it would be vinyl, but it isn't. It might be some sort of fake leather, or maybe it was reupholstered, but it's actually a pretty nice and relatively comfortable seating material, although that's where the relatively nice ends. So you can see the floor is just a plastic or vinyl surface, the entire floor of this car. You don't get nice floor mats or carpet back here. Even though this one wasn't used as a police car, which sometimes have people bleeding or vomiting in the back, these still don't get nice stuff in back. That's just not the purpose of this car. The door panel, as you can see, is just one big slab of plastic. You don't even get a little storage compartment in the door panel in case you wanted to stick some storage item like a phone or a drink. No, you just get cheap plastic. In fact, there's no cup holders back here at all. You can't put drinks anywhere. There's no space for it, not even in the center armrest, because there isn't a center armrest that folds down. That's another thing they decontented and took out of this car. You don't even have storage folder pockets on the backs of the front seats. You can see where the plastic support for those pockets would have been, but they decided not to add it to these cars. Again, it was a way to save a few dollars and make this car more profitable and make it make sense as a decision that they made. And so, so you don't have, well, basically anything back here, except you do have a lot of interior space. This is a big sedan and I knew it was gonna be roomy back here and oh boy, is it ever. There's a lot of headroom, leg room, knee room. It really is a spacious large sedan, just like the Chevy Caprice always was back when Chevy sold it here in the United States. Really a spacious back seat. And next up, we move on to the trunk, the cargo area of the Chevy Caprice. We open it, of course, with a traditional lock and key because, well, remember, no frill. You open it up and you discover there's a lot of storage space in this car. Again, just like the old school Caprice, a full-size sedan with room for everything back here. Well, the new school Caprice has it too. A really spacious trunk with a lot of depth. Even once you open the trunk and look in there, there's more than you might expect. Now, the trunk is similarly decontented, cheap, no frills, the rest of the car. You do have trunk carpeting on the bottom, but it is very flimsy, thin, cheap stuff, and you don't even have a trunk liner on the inside to keep your stuff from bouncing around and contacting the metal inside the trunk. Now, the cool thing with that is the trunk liner is gone, so you can see the little label that GM puts on the inside of the trunk to let you know all of the options on this car. Of course, it's all option codes and I don't know them, but it is cool to see that label, and it's especially cool to see the VIN for this car, which of course starts with the number six. Six is the international VIN code for Australia. You don't see a lot of cars with a VIN starting with the number six. It is very rare, only a few cars have it. Special shout out to the 1990 to 1994 Mitsubishi Capri. But anyway, beyond the trunk and the cargo area, the other thing you notice back here, you got dual exhaust, big old dual exhaust, because this is the V8, and boy does it rumble. Even though this is the police car, they took out all the nice stuff, it still has a pretty good sound. Take a listen.
And by the way, speaking of that engine, one thing I love when you look under the hood, they didn't even put a plastic cover in the engine compartment that says Chevrolet, which I'm sure they did in all the other markets across the world. But here, it was another thing they could take out of the car, another $2 saved to make this car just a little bit more profitable. So you have a fairly anonymous looking engine, even if it is a big six liter GM V8. All right, driving the Caprice PPV. And I'm excited about it. I thought this car was a cool idea when it first came out, a cop-only car. And I always kind of fantasized about having one in this exact spec, which is the V8 um, with no, like, cop like partition with the backs the real back seat and with no like holes drilled in it like this is the dream caprice ppv if there ever was such a thing and in my mind there is i thought it was so weird when they came out with this car like a police only car built in australia how bizarre but I've always kind of liked it, and I always get sort of excited when I see one on the road. So first impression, I'm surprised how rumbly the V8 is. <laughs> like, even though this thing was just made for the police market, at least here in the States, it's got a nice roar to it. Like, you feel powerful and big, which is kind of cool. And it's not just the sound. Stepping on it here, this V8 has some power. Mm. It really goes. And it feels bulky and brawny. It really does have some muscle to it. Uh, good mid-range power. Transmission's a little slow by like the standards of today with dual clutches and EVs. Takes a second to get down there, but it moves. I mean, I think the thing to keep in mind is this car was not built just for the police market. So it's not like they built a sort of crappy car to the lowest bidder standards. It was in the States built that way, but in foreign countries, this was a civilian car they sold to civilians. So it had to have a good powertrain and it does. It is nice. It feels good. Whew. Yeah, let's get after it. Yeah, the transmission is definitely the kind of the weak point. Not that it feels like it's braking or anything, just that the shifts are slow. They're definitely tuned more for smoothness than they are for anything else. I will say also the steering is not ideal. Pretty typical of a General Motors car of this era, if I'm being totally honest, but you basically move the wheel for a little bit, nothing happens, and then a little bit more and then a lot happens, and it's not the most linear steering feel that you would possibly want. Uh, definitely could be a little bit better. In terms of ride quality, surprisingly comfortable. Feels good. It's not a luxury car by any means, but it feels like how you'd expect like a large sedan to feel. Um, you feel bumps, but they're not like excessive or, or you know, too much or anything like that. It drives like a, like a full-size sedan. If you've spent time in a Crown Vic, imagine sort of a newer one with, you know, slightly better suspension and a little bit more uh, comfortable. One thing I am surprised by is just how quickly this car handles. The steering is not really that ideal, like I mentioned, but the handling is pretty good. It's sharp. It changes directions pretty quickly, and there's not a significant amount of body roll. It makes sense. It's more related to the Pontiac G8 and the Chevy SS, both of which were pretty good performance sedans, sports sedans. This car feels much more like that than like a Caprice in the normal sense of the word that you would think about it as an American. It is surprisingly athletic, um, considering that, you know, it's kind of a big sedan and that it was only made for the police market. I'm actually surprised this is a decent car. I, I guess I shouldn't be so surprised because again, this was made as a decent car in foreign markets. I just look at it as sort of a stripper special government fleet car, and usually those are not particularly great. Certainly the interior of this one is the lowest spec trim they could possibly find, but the driving experience, that is definitely not the case, and, and it is uh, better than I thought it would be in terms of the way it accelerates, the way it handles, and just how like relatively comfortable, quiet, and nice it is in here. Overall, this is a cool car. It is interesting. It's definitely quirky. It's got a weird history in the States. The Pontiac G8 and Chevy SS themselves are already weird and unusual cars, and this is even weirder and even more unusual. And getting like a civilian spec one, which this essentially is with the V8, that's the dream if you want one of these cars. It's neat, it's interesting, and I've wanted to review it ever since I first started making videos. It was always on my list. I wanted to check out and see what this car was all about, and I'm thrilled I finally had the chance to do it. And honestly, it's better than I expected. It's pretty cool, and you can probably get people to move out of the way for you on the freeway <laughs> as an added bonus. And so that's the 2013 Chevy Caprice PPV. It's a car with a weird past and frankly a weird present. And I'm glad that I finally had the chance to review one. And you can buy this one on Cars and Bids. Anyway, now it's time to give the Caprice PPV a Doug score. 
And the Doug score is here, 54 out of 100, which puts the Caprice here against some other cars that, well, aren't really very similar at all, but they're sort of close. I actually really like the Caprice. It's like a better Crown Victoria, more anonymous, larger inside, and really legitimately fast. This is a fun car and a surprisingly affordable car to own and buy. The Caprice is way cheaper than it should be because most people forget about it. That's good news if you want a Chevy SS, but you can't afford it. This isn't as good, but it's close and a lot less expensive. Expensive. <laughs>